I'm Joe Kane. I'm Dan Kane. I'm Sal Conca. And I'm Wayne Heckler. And this is the Imperfect Podcast. Don't forget to go to hecklercane.com and sign up to become an Imperfect Podcast Insider. To the bumper. (laughs) So today's guest is Tom Jennings. He's a Peabody Award winning documentary filmmaker and journalist. He has written, produced, and directed more than 400 hours of programming on a variety of topics, including politics, religion, history, crime, sports, mystery, and travel. Pretty cool guy, too. Uh, he, he was just so informational. Yeah. He gave so much information on being a documentary filmmaker. Uh, like we've, I, 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 It was like a master class in documentary yes. filmmaking. So if you have any interest in being a documentary filmmaker, this is the episode for you. He's All of his shows he's done, he's released with National Geographic, the Smithsonian Channel, um, the History Channel. I mean, he's done all the major, any any of the Lost Tapes series that you've seen, whether it's Son of Sam, the L.A. Riots. And John York, Wilkes Booth. John yeah. Wilkes Booth. And the new one that's Diana. coming in a few weeks is um, Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Um, the, the reason we found him, uh, I reached out on Twitter through his company, 1895 Films, and his uh, film Netflix that was shot for the 20th anniversary of Princess Diana was uh, Diana in Her Own Words. Which he talks about that complete journey about yeah. filming this document. Well, not filming, but go, getting this um, uh, protected archival footage of her speaking. Yeah, and how that spawned. It was like seven hours worth of footage. You know, pared down to a L. A. Riots film. I mean, a spade, the Challenger. You know, yep. I mean, he made a lot. I'm checking out some good information. He makes me want to go out and do, do a, documentary. a documentary now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of these guys that I think we really could have stayed on the line with him for oh, sure. hours. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because he shot so much, he's got so much experience, and his stories are great. So <laughs> a you true know, storyteller, right? He Whether really you're is. talking to him or watching his films, he really is. So everyone. Hear what Tom has to say. We hope you enjoy. Hey, Tom, welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, guys, for having me. Of course, of course. I uh, I reached out on Twitter uh, through um, uh, 1895 Films, and uh, you know they were talking about some of your work and things like this, and. You know, I really wanted to find out a lot about all the documentary work you've been doing. Um, you know, we mentioned some of it a, a bit ago in terms of all the awards you've won and things like that. But I, I'd like to get a bit of your history and background. Like, where did your passion for documentary work come from? What 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 was your background like? Well, I was a newspaper reporter. That was my chosen career. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I started out, I worked in Washington, D.C., and then came to Southern California and worked here for newspapers. And I actually uh, wound up covering the uh, first O.J. Simpson criminal trial and kind of really burned out on journalism after covering that trial. And it was right at the time when uh, the cable television industry was starting to take off. And uh, friends of mine knew of production companies that needed writers uh, to write nonfiction television because there was a great need uh, for places like uh, the early Discovery Channel and History Channel. Mm-hmm. And that was right up my alley. That's what I would do. I would write long feature stories for newspapers about particular events or people. And I started writing them, and uh, writing led into producing, which led into directing. <laughs> and in 2004, I sold something to the Discovery Channel on my own, and mm-hmm. I've had my own company ever since. Um, I re- so I didn't go to film school. I had, I had no film background whatsoever. But when I got in, out into the field and started doing interviews with people you know, on various topics, that, uh, for example, the History Channel had me doing. Um, I went to school kind of on the backs of all the film crews that I was working with because, you know, one thing as a journalist that you learn early on is that people like to talk about what they do if you show a genuine interest in what they do. Mm-hmm. And so I'd be like, well, what's three point lighting? Or, what, you know, why do you do, you know, well, why are you using that lens instead of that lens? And so for the first couple of years of going out and uh, working with film crews, I really got an education on how to put uh, nonfiction documentary television together. 
And I just went from there. I loved it. It was like a whole new world opened up to me. Well, that's cool. some of the best training you can get is on set and on uh, right in the middle of it and just going and being there a part of what's going on. That's it's an excellent education right there, even though it's not a formal classroom education. Yeah, I, I would fail film theory classes. You know, I just <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't even know where to start with that stuff. But I sure can go out and, you know, get the right material in the can to make for a good uh, doc for television. And you're sorry. Um, so so what was your first film like? Tell us what your first film was. Were you proud of it? What did you feel about your yeah. first film? Uh, the very first thing I did was for the History Channel, actually. And it was on something called The Lost Colony of Roanoke Island. Mm, oh, wow. And. Uh, th this was back in the day when places like Discovery and History were doing just kind of cool stories. Now, when you sell stuff to the networks, it can't just be a cool story anymore. There has to be something new. There has to be another way in. There has to be new information that was never known before. There have to be aliens involved. You know, it's uh, <laughs> right. there's nice. there, it's a whole different dynamic. But when I started in the late '90s. Uh, they um, just wanted you to go out and do a great job because there, there weren't that many really solid cable docs about the world. I went to crazy places like Easter Island and French Guiana to do Devil's Island, the whole Papillon story. But my first show was about the lost colony of Roanoke Island. And for people who don't know that story in brief, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh came over from uh, England, and uh, I hope to, uh, and he came over and he um, uh, he uh, dropped off 300 people on this island off the coast of North Carolina called Roanoke, mm -hmm. and said, "I'll be right back. You know, I'm going to go <laughs> get some supplies." <laughs> and he went back to uh, London, and uh, unfortunately, at the time, the Spanish Armada kicked in and blockaded uh, the British Isles. And so he couldn't get back to Roanoke Island. When he finally did, it was three years later. And when he got to Roanoke, no one was there. And not only was no one there, there wasn't a shred of evidence of anyone having been there. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the great mysteries of American history. It was the first colony of British people that came over uh, many years before Jamestown. And so what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? No one really knows. And so I went down there and fortunately for me, and I learned this early on and uh, other filmmakers might appreciate this, uh, that was when we were starting off doing recreations for history type of programming. Mm -hmm. And they can be really poorly done if you're not careful. <laughs> We've seen some uh, of those. Actually, We've seen a bunch of those. <laughs> yes. But I got lucky because I had a really great camera operator and a crew. And what we did was, um, and this was by complete luck, um, every year uh, in uh, the town uh, near Roanoke Island, um, they have what's called summer stock, you know, where uh, uh, actors go out and they perform in various places outside of New York City, for example. And they do a play about the lost colony of Roanoke. Mm -hmm. And they were just wrapping up the summer. We were shooting very close to Labor Day weekend. And so I, you know, I was a producer and I didn't even know it at the time. <laughs> I went and talked to the theater director and I said, do you think these guys would do the play? They have a stage set up there. And I said, do you think they would do the play or, you know, kind of like act out the scenes for us? But instead of doing it on the stage, can we take them out into the woods, into the forest? <laughs> and they said, yeah, that'd be great. Nobody's ever asked us to do that before. And so <laughs> my first film, I had great interviews, this great mystery. and But on top of it, I had these great images to go with it. It looked like I really knew what I was doing. Because <laughs> these were gr terrific actors. They had they brought all the costumes, which were very legitimate, you know, to the time period. Yeah. They knew how to act and behave. And um, I just 
crushed it. And I wow, I didn't even know I crushed it. I just thought, well, that's how it always works. <laughs> right, right. Sure. That's great. That's great. That's as great. much as, you know, you're, you're a, obviously a writer, a uh, nonfiction writer uh, by trade. And a um, do you consider yourself a historian? Because you're, you're documenting all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a historian? Not really. Uh, I, uh, only because I think true historians have to take such deep dives into subject matter, you know, whether you're writing a book or it becomes a career. Um, uh, you know, when I was in journalism school, they used to tell us that um, they were giving us a cocktail education, meaning you could go to a cocktail party and talk a little bit about a lot of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's kind of what, uh, you know, television documentaries are in a way. It's like you immerse yourself for a couple of months in a topic, you put it together, you turn, you know, you do all of the technical filmmaking stuff that has to go with that. And then you move on to something else because you just, you know, part of it is to just keep the machine moving. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do know a lot of great stories about a, a lot of things, but if I, you know, to rattle off in depth and be able to call myself a historian on um, certain issues, I think wouldn't necessarily be accurate, but I can't say that I'm a great lover of history. Sure. You have to have that appreciation uh, to, to be yeah. doing what you do anyway. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think the, it's fair to say not everybody as filmmakers could do what you do, because if you don't have a passion for it, I, like, yeah. you know, us sitting on this. I don't know if any of us could do. <laughs> well, you being a reporter, some... that's what it is. Yes. It came from that standpoint. So it's like you're reporting history. You know, as opposed to writing it. Exactly. Um, you know, we had a, a film. It's on Netflix right now. It was on the National Geographic Channel. They were the ones who commissioned it. It was on this past year, um, called Diana in Her Own Words, mm -hmm. and that's a fascinating story. And it has to do with what you talk about applying journalism to what we do. In the last few years, we've been very successful selling different uh, uh, selling programming to different networks that is a, a, a very hard type of programming to do in filmmaking, which is there's uh, in nonfiction, there's no narrator and we do no interviews. Mm -hmm. We only use archive to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And the archive that we got for the Diana film was actually from an author named Andrew Morton who wrote a very famous book in 1992 where Diana, without being named as the source, had basically spilled her guts to Andrew Morton through a series of tape recordings that were made by a mutual friend of theirs. Uh, the mutual friend would get questions from Morton. He would go to Kensington Palace. He and Princess Diana would find some quiet room somewhere, and he would record these interviews. Uh, what was really fascinating about them is because Diana was talking to someone she had known since childhood, the interviews became almost just conversational. And um, when we approached Andrew Morton to uh, use his uh, tapes to tell her story, because uh, last year was the 20th anniversary of her death and networks love anniversary shows, sure. wow. um, his first question was, well, get in line. Uh, everybody <laughs> else has asked me for these things and you know, their historical record and, uh, you know, we're, we're not interested. But then I explained to him, look, there's not going to be anyone else in this film talking other than news media at the, from the time period. No one else is going to be talking. This is going to be a film about Diana, narrated by Diana. Mm -hmm. It's never been done before. And on top of that, what we did is when we, and he said, no one's ever asked us to do it that way before. He, was, he thought, what a great idea. <laughs> so we were able to license the tapes. That's great. But in, in deference to the historical record, which, you know, when you're making nonfiction and if you're making, you know, even if it's current day, you have to be really careful. It's so easy if you look at Diana documentaries, for example, mm -hmm. They'll just pull out an image of her from 1992 when they're talking about something that happened in 1985 because they happen to like that particular photograph. Mm -hmm. Well, we had all kinds of rules that we established in that if you're talking about a particular moment in time, you cannot have something from 92 illustrating what's going on in 85. Yeah. And so 
we made sure, uh, my editors, I drive them crazy, but it, we, <laughs> it was, unless she, if she was not talking about a specific event, we, our rule was the image from Getty or from any of the major places that we were getting to help tell that part of the story uh, could not exceed a limit of three months on either side of the time period in which she was talking about. Mm -hmm. wow. And because we knew, you know, when you get something like Diana herself telling her story, it would be highly scrutinized. Sure. And you're, you're putting yourself out there for condemnation you know, it's like being in uh, court and perjuring yourself. If that picture's wrong, maybe they're all wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we're very, very careful when we do that. Maybe the, uh, I'm a historian in that sense, in that I don't want to get it wrong because I feel like the things we're making, you could watch them 20 years from now. Nice. They would still hold water. And they, I, I find them to be like the definitive document of what the story is. Sure. And you, so I, I watched it on Netflix this week. I thought it was outstanding, by the way. It was a Thank great, you. great piece. Um, and it was interesting to me. My big question, which you started to answer a little bit, but was, you know, to produce something like this, obviously getting the tapes was the major hurdle, right? But after that, uh, I'm sure I'm sure there's a great story, more to that story than there's maybe. A lot to maybe that story. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure we'll talk about it off air maybe for a little while. Sure. But, um, okay. Uh, you know, I'm uh, in terms of putting that together because you're not shooting any, you're not shooting any footage, you're not shooting any interviews. So everything is either stock footage, photos. You mentioned Getty images. So how long does it take to accrue the amount of footage you need to match the audio? Like what? How chicken and egg mm -hmm. is it? Right? You go through all the audio. Is that where it starts? And you say you chop up the audio and say this is the story I want to tell, and then put the images to it. How does that all go? Well, um, there, each of them is a little bit different depending on the kind of core source material that we have available. Mm -hmm. Diana is a, a, a really good example of how the process works um, for when you have something like a very exclusive archive of someone as famous as Princess Diana and something as so behind the scenes that people have never heard before. And so we went through, there were seven hours of recordings that Diana had made with her friend that Morton had. And um, we were able, he gave me a copy of the seven hours and we went through them and we made uh, a storyboard, much like any filmmaker would, uh, basically listing all of the kind of story beats that she talked about and which beats were she talked about at length versus just momentary asides. Mm -hmm. We had something about uh, like 140 story cards up on a board. And so so we knew what we had. And, and the way we did it is, well, we have to tell the story of Diana that people know. You know, what are the broad strokes? She was this person from, uh, granted, a royal family, but relatively unknown. She meets Charles. They get married. You know, mm -hmm. they have kids. So we, we mapped it out. It was a two-hour film. We mapped out the kind of story beats that we knew we had to cover, just because if you're going to do something on Diana, you have to talk about the fact that she got married. Mm -hmm. Then we started to take the cards, the beats, where we knew this was stuff people had not heard before, and they're from events that um, she's describing an event that may have been filmed, but no one really ever knew what her true feelings were about these events. And we started to fill in the blanks like that. And the one thing that we were very careful to do and why it works so well, I think, is that in going through, kind of calling through everything that Diana had said in these recordings, we, um, we purposefully chose story beats. Um, you can imagine out of seven hours, we wound up using something like maybe 50, 55 minutes of Diana herself speaking. Yeah. Um, we purposely chose story beats where we could find footage of the event. For example, she talks about going to Wales the first time where she has to give a speech in Welsh and mm -hmm. how nervous she is about being in front of these people and uh, not really understanding her role or what was expected of her. Well, we found that there was a lot of footage of that because she had instantaneously become the most famous person in the world. So 
we purposely chose where Diana went into great detail about events, mm -hmm. where we had lots of coverage of that event, both in footage and in stills, and then put it together. So as you said, you've seen it, 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 it almost has this um, ethereal vibe going on that we put together this footage of Diana and then she sat down and narrated it for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even though the tapes were recorded in 1991 and she might've been talking about something in 1981, well, it fit together the way it did because that was a very conscious choice that we're only gonna use the stuff that she talks about that we can best illustrate. So you have to balance what you have versus mm -hmm. what you can get, and not only what you can get, what you can afford, what you can license. I mean, there's so many things that go sure. into using archival footage. It's a nightmare <laughs> most of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. <laughs> but that's how, we, that's how we do a lot of it. You have, to, <clears throat> you have to tell, like we have, a, since this isn't coming out for a few weeks, we do a series on the Smithsonian Channel called The Lost Tapes, mm -hmm. and we have a new film on uh, Malcolm X coming out. And it is... You know, to watch Malcolm X speak, you know, to go back and go through all of this archival material, you know, much like Diana, when you when I first sat in the room, you know, the uh, Andrew Morton's publisher's office on a rainy day in London, you know, <laughs> listening to seven straight hours of Diana talking, it's the same thing. You immerse yourself in someone like Malcolm X. I didn't know much about him, you know, the Denzel Washington film, for example, you know, you've, I, I, I knew bits and pieces. I knew he had been assassinated. I knew he was very fiery and had battles with Dr. Martin Luther King. But to be able to watch hours and hours and hours of Malcolm X speaking, I, I found him to be one of the most fascinating people I've ever watched on a screen. He was so eloquent and funny and uh, you know all of these things you didn't know about him are brought to life this way cool. but we had to find all of the stuff and then we had to license all of this stuff and then still be true to the story so it's really right. um it's it's like playing three level chess every time we put one of these together sure it seems mm -hmm. to me that you're very passionate about getting the story correct which is which is admirable yeah. and and that yeah. leads to a lot of things where you know uh, people will come back to you to write the next thing and to do the next thing because you've put the, put in the dirty work, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. I do want to say that I do love this series. I watch, um, you have a few. You have um, the L.A. Riots, which you touch mm -hmm. on. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. Um, the Challenger I liked. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. seeing that in school in 85, yeah. and I yeah. saw it blow yep. up. So to go back yep. and see that footage and her talk before it happens, I remember that too. Yep. But I love, yep. I, and I love the series that you say that, um, and this is footage that hasn't ever been seen before. So you bring another edge to it, which is very nice. And you are telling the story. So I, I enjoy the series. I think anyone listening yep. should Thanks. definitely check Same it out. Yeah. yeah. How many? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, let me just say go one ahead. thing about Challenger because. I think, uh, you know, as uh, any filmmaker, whether it's nonfiction doc or even, uh, you know, uh, uh, feature style filmmaking, I mean, you always have to think outside the box. And, you know, Challenger had been done many, many times, you know, and rightly so. It's a tragic story. And um, uh, when that was for uh, National Geographic Channel again. And they said, well, we want to do Challenger in your style. And um, I said, OK, well, we'll have to see what we can find, you know, thinking that it's all been said and done before. We went to NASA, you know, that footage that you just mentioned about her, you know, where she te she's teaching the class that she was intending to teach, you know, like in a dress rehearsal aboard the Challenger itself. Um, most of that had never been seen. And um, when we went to NASA and said, we need your Challenger archive, um, fortunately, they just sent us like 30 beta tapes, wow. uh, which we had to transfer. I mean, wow. it, was, it was a whole <laughs> technical thing behind it. But I, I make my researchers, and as much as I can, we go through everything. Because mm -hmm. it's not, I don't want to see... You know, the Lost Tapes is all about, I don't want to see the aired piece on the CBS Evening News. I want to see what happened on either side of what got cut into the show. I want the raw footage. 
And about 28 tapes in, we find all of this stuff of Krista McAuliffe rehearsing her lesson plans aboard the Challenger. And we called NASA and they said, you know, like, this is amazing. We haven't seen this before. And, and sure enough, they said, well, we give it to everybody. It's just they never bother going through everything. <laughs> wow. And I, it was stunning to me. So it was laying there the whole time. And part of uh, one other thing about thinking outside the box, especially with archive, is um, we decided, OK, well, where else can you get? Because it's too easy for nonfiction filmmakers to just call Getty. Uh, or uh, NBC News, you know, they're great resources, but, you know, they have their kind of, even National Archives, if you go down there and say, oh, you know, we're doing Pearl Harbor, it's like, well, here's the highlights reel. Mm. And what they don't tell you is there's like 100 rolls of film back down the hall that nobody's bothered to look at in 40 years. And you have to go do that. And so for Challenger, other than the NASA stuff, we started to think about, well, okay, well, where could we find something that maybe is different than what people know? And I remember that Chris McAuliffe was from Concord, New Hampshire. And so we called a small radio station in Concord, New Hampshire, and it turned out that they had kept all of their coverage of Chris McAuliffe training for the year and then their news director was actually on the launch pad, you know, at that grandstand, those, those tragic famous shots that we all can remember. Mm -hmm. And he was there broadcasting live. And so instead of having the typical, uh, you know, national news broadcasters telling you this story, we had a guy from Concord, New Hampshire, who was not a national news correspondent, who was intimately involved with the story, who brought so much more emotion to it than anyone else possibly could. And we had the entire record. And when we called them and said, hey, we're doing this thing on Challenger for National Geographic, you know, do you have anything? I swear to God, the, the researcher up there was like almost crying, like someone had finally called them and asked if they had wow. Challenger material. And it, 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 you know, on top of the NASA finds that we made, I think that made the show, and that's the one that just won the Emmy for Best Documentary Research. That's fantastic. Congratulations on that. That's Thanks. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. I think it's we were at the age where we all just remember we were all watching it in school, and that story yep. is so yeah, so close to everybody yeah. you know, at, at this time. So yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so how many, uh, in, in terms of the Lost Tapes, which is a series of, of – mm -hmm. um, documentaries that you've done how many have total been shot it looks like seven and then the malcolm x one will be eight how many how many lost tapes that shows have you done? uh i think there's 10 total okay um although malcolm x is the uh, part of the new season uh that's starting february 26th okay um we did pearl harbor a, a one that um really resonated with people I mean, you never know what's going to work we just did one on the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. Mm -hmm. uh, and before that, we did the Son of Sam murders in New York City. And um, yeah. uh, we yeah. had we had a screening in New York. The network did. You know, they do a very nice job when they want to celebrate these films. And they, they do feel that they're very special. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was kind of strange because uh, Geraldo Rivera was supposed to be on the panel. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because he kind of, uh, cut his teeth as a young reporter on the Son of yeah. Sam story, mm. the yeah. uh, the serial killer mm. David Berkowitz in New York City in 1977, and um, Geraldo. Just as a really quick funny aside, we had this screening in this very nice screening room in in Manhattan, and Geraldo couldn't make it all of a sudden because he um, had to cover O.J. Simpson's in uh, in Vegas. Uh, whether oh, or not he was going to be paroled. That's when we had our, uh, you know, the, his, the day of his parole hearing was the day of our screening. <laughs> and so they, they set it up. So much like Skype, they Skyped in Geraldo <laughs> from a set in Las Vegas. And we had this 10 foot Geraldo Rivera, you know, <laughs> answering questions as part of the panel discussion. And, but it was myself and one of the detectives who had worked on the case, uh -huh. uh, and and the point I want to make is the detective had not seen the film, mm -hmm. 
before, and you know, people always say, oh, lost tapes, really. I've probably seen this all before. The de- one of the detectives who actually was part of hunting Berkowitz down said, I got to tell you, you know, I lived through it, and I don't remember seeing half of this stuff. I don't know where you got it from, mm. but well done. Wow. And, you know, that's like, nice okay, compliment. we did our job. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a great compliment yeah, right exactly. there. Exactly. Now, when you're doing this, um, they're all being done for a network. All of them are on National Geographic. Do they hold you to a particular schedule or budget? Or so, mm. so now that you're not, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so how long do you get to produce each episode? Now, what is the production schedule like on these? Is not, it not long enough? <laughs> it never, it never is, right? Well, but, you say that for any production is never long ne- enough. It never is, but. <laughs> They, they work with us. We've done uh, one-offs for Nat Geo, like Challenger and Diana. The Lost Tapes are on Smithsonian Channel. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, they're television shows. They're different than um, Labors of Love documentaries or independent feature films where someone's, you know, raising money and shooting. And, you know, I, I get how that all works. When you uh, do programming for a network, um, you sign a contract and... The contract, you know, gives you a certain budget that you have to work within Mm -hmm. and they give you milestones and you don't get paid until you hit the milestones. And um, usually these films take uh, like a lost tapes, for example, will take um, maybe six months to eight months total from like. Uh, thinking about it until delivering the master. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, when you do a series, as some of your filmmakers may know, I mean, you're basically like an air traffic controller at LAX and you're just stacking (laughs) these things out, you know, and uh, there's another master rolling into the network every two or three weeks. And um, you got, it's uh, the, the downside of having my own production company is the business side of the business, which I really don't like, and uh, but you have to pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather be sitting, you know, with the archive films. I'd much rather be sitting in the edit bays with my wonderful editors and put the stuff together. I'd much rather be, you know, listening to Diana talking all day long. But at the same time, you've got to deal with all of the tech. You know, it's when you have a small production company, as you guys may know. I mean, it's soup and nuts. You have to yep. go from concept to delivery and everything that goes with it. And uh, I may not be able to, you know, cut a show on Avid or Final Cut, but I certainly understand the process that those guys have to go through and online and color correcting and mixing and everything that goes into it and stabilizing frames. Mm -hmm. I I have to know that stuff. And um, it's good that I know it so that, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, I can understand what it is. Well, clearly. Uh, The networks, you know, they... the networks know what they want and they know when they want it. And if you want to keep making shows for them, you're going to give them what they need when they want it. Right. Sure. Well, clearly, you know, the business end. I mean, you've, you've been churning out a ton of, of work here. Your body of work speaks for itself. Uh, you know, the, the amount of awards you've won and all that, um, you know, over the past couple of uh, decades. So, you know, in, in yeah. terms of that, I'm sure you've had some uh, not so great moments. Um, so I'm curious, are there any documentaries that you went after that, you know, maybe you just never got the footage and it never made, made it to production. I mean, was there something that you went after that you still have your, you know, your great white, uh, whale that you're trying to make? Is there something out there that the footage just doesn't exist? Like, I'm curious, uh, of that side of it. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> unfortunately probably more than you, uh, yeah. you have time for, um, I did something a while ago for uh, investigation discovery for a particular crime series. Um, I, when I was a reporter, I covered a lot of crime, so crime comes easy to me. I understand it. I know how to talk to cops. Um, you know, I know how to do public record searches, things like that. And uh, one of the episodes they had us do for this particular crime series was on the death of Michael Jackson um, several years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very difficult um, on budgets, uh, large or small, to license images and certainly music of Michael Jackson. Yes. And um it was very frustrating to think, well, we're only going to get the same 10 photographs that everybody else gets. And 
you know, we wanted to illustrate somehow, this was not like an all archive thing. We went out and shot B-roll of locations. We did interviews with people, things like that. And um, so I was trying to problem solve, like we need more Michael Jackson in this show. Mm -hmm. So you know, what are we gonna do? And uh, it was, it, it worked. And I'm not saying I'm not, uh, I'm not proud of it. I wish I had a budget that I could have afforded all of the real stuff. But what we did was we found uh, a Michael Jackson impersonator. Now, before you start laughing, um, but I didn't want to shoot them as, it, it was actually a woman who does this Michael Jackson show here in Los Angeles, or she did at the time. And so we did her like in shadow play. You know, where we put, uh, we, so she did the whole dance routine that she does with the hat and the glove, and we just shot this thing like for hours, you know, until wow, no man. one could see it anymore. But <laughs> the series was such that we could get away with something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, budgets are what they are, and I, I would wish that every doc that we do for a television network, we would be able to put in whatever we want. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was, you know, because it's Michael Jackson, there was just, you know, I mean, it, we could have been doing it for CBS and it, it probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to afford because nonfiction budgets, even on major, major networks are still much smaller than uh, episodic and feature. Um, I got, so, I got to say, uh, I love the problem solving there, trying to like get oh, Michael oh. Jackson in a silhouette <laughs> as as opposed to like having like the actual archival footage. I, I think that's phenomenal from a filmmaker it, standpoint. It works. From it a filmmaker works. standpoint, that's just absolutely oozing <laughs> awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like, I like that you do all, you hit all the time periods because you also did John Wilkes Spoof. So you're going like Michael oh, Jackson, I John Wilkes Spoof. That's a good I one. I met my wife doing that. Did you? Um, oh, really? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Which is a funny story in and of itself. I know his brother, but, uh, I think, is the founder of the Players Club in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah that's true. John Wilkes Booth. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, of the Players Club, yes. In the Players Club in Manhattan, they have pictures of him. It's like they go back to his right. brother. Nice. That's very interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. Right. You know, the, the John Wilkes Booth thing, I'm glad you mentioned, that was almost all reenactment. And that came from, you know, you never know when a story fascinates you, how it might come back around. And when I was first starting out in journalism, I was fascinated by, and I, I happened to be, get a job in Washington, D.C., and I was fascinated by the story of the Lincoln assassination and John Wilkes Booth. And so I went down to this place called the Mary Surratt Society. Mary Surratt was the woman who, um, uh, you know, had the boarding house that all of the conspirators met in. She was the first woman executed in the United States. She was one of the four that was hanged, if you mm -hmm. remember that very famous mm -hmm, photograph yeah. of the four of them. And I, it turned out, I didn't know this, that the Surratt Society sponsors this tour twice a year where for 12 hours, one hour for each day that um, uh, John Wilkes Booth was on the run, they take you on, the, at the time it was a yellow school bus, and you just retrace the steps of John Wilkes Booth and David Harold as they made their way down to, you know, through Southern Maryland and then tried to cross into Virginia. And I didn't know any of this stuff. You know, it's it, most people know that John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln in Ford's theater, and they caught him in a tobacco bar, and they shot him after they set it on fire. <laughs> and but, that's it, right. Well, those events stretch over 12 days, and these 12 days on the run fascinated me. So years later, I was when I had my own company, I went to the History Channel, I said, you know, uh, there's this part of this story that's just completely overlooked, and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, they went for it, and we wound up doing a lot of reenactments. Um, that was when we really HD had just come in, and w I loved it. We were in the actual locations with an actor that I happened to stumble across who looked a lot like John Wilkes Booth, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was uh, even the booth aficionados of which there are many who want to, you know, take things apart for every small detail you might have missed. Even they said, wow, you know, nice job. Mm -hmm. I, 
I was very grateful to be able to put something like that together and to just show there's hope. Two years after we did that, I got a call from Robert Redford's production company. Huh. And this guy said, hey, we really love your John Wilkes Booth thing. We're doing a new motion picture called The Conspirator with Robin Wright starring, and she is going to be Mary Surratt in this huh. film made a few years ago. And we would like you to make the documentary version of Mary Surratt's story oh, wow. for our DVD. So I wound up being on the DVD of The Conspirator directed by Robert Redford nice. because I happened, all because I took a ride on a bus many years ago <laughs> and followed John Wilkes Booth around. Wow, nice. that's Sorry. crazy. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, your stories are incredible. I, I, we could probably Thank talk you. to you for like, I don't know, hours, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I want to wrap things up. And, you know, we like to leave everybody with a little bit of parting advice. Um, is there something like you would feel for filmmakers that want to get into documentary work, something that you, you know, some bit of advice that you would give them, somebody looking to break in the industry or wanting to work in documentaries? Uh, you have to love what you do, um, I, I think, because, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a very competitive field there's there's many people like me that love what we do um the hours of programming for this kind of material on television while they may be growing slightly um it's still probably easier to sell a reality show mm -hmm. um uh i would advise people to you know not certainly not give up um and but what we were talking about earlier about problem solving Look, you know, if this network doesn't want it, maybe you can tailor it for something else. We've done, we've even done programming for international distributors about th about stories that I have a passion for, mm -hmm. that we just can't find a home for here. And so it's like, well, we'll just make it ourselves. So sometimes you just have to step up and figure out how you can make things work as best you can uh, on your own and keep pushing. I mean, there's always another way in, you, you know, who knew that I'd be doing a doc that would go with a, a, a as a companion piece to a Robert Redford film about <laughs> one of my favorite stories, you know, probably 15 years after I first learned about it. Uh, there's never an idea that truly goes away when you're doing documentary storytelling. There may be another home for it and it'll come up and appear in front of you when you least expect it. Nice. Awesome. That's perfect. Thanks yeah, so much, yeah. Tom. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have any way to, to top that. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of your work is on television. A lot of your stuff is on National Geographic Channel and Smithsonian. Is there any way where people can uh, specifically look up your films? Um, I guess IMDb or do you have a website that you want to direct people to? Uh -huh. uh, 1895 films dot com is our company. 1895 named by the way people always think oh is that your address i'm like no uh it it's a it's a little uh inside baseball 1895 uh, was the first year of the motion picture camera in france with the lumiere brothers so oh, awesome. that's where the title comes from yeah, Fun fact. You, you have to guess that that has to be a historic time. It can't be an address. Yeah, I know. Knowing you, that's a simple one. Of <laughs> I, course, it's a year. I knew it was definitely a historical time, but I had no idea it was what it was, what the fact Absolutely. was. So <laughs> now we all know. That's, a, that's very appropriate. <laughs> exactly. And, yes. no, and nobody else can have that now. There you go. Tom, it's been a pleasure <laughs> talking with you. Yeah. Guys, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much really for coming on. Thank you. Take Good care, guys. Tom. Don't forget to go to hecklacane.com and sign up to become an Imperfect Podcast Insider.